Hey y'all, Barley here. And I'd like to tell you the story of how Barley's fur and fine leather is taking over Alaska while doing some flying in the Cessna 208 and ATR-72. I've been on vacation for several weeks, and in that time, I've managed to build up quite the fur and meat trade in the land of the midnight sun using On Air's uh, Industries beta feature. In beta. A sign right there. And in this episode of On Air Heavy Metal, I'd like to show you some things I've learned and how I'm building my operation up, and even some mistakes that I've made along the way. First, I needed base camps, so I flew to Elmendorf Air Force Base to pick up some base camp construction kits so I could then fly them all the way up north to set them up so I could uh, build factories at each one. Landing time. So here's Anchorage, where I have my 208, and right next to it is Elmendorf Air Base where I went to go pick up the base camp construction kit. And then I didn't have this at the time, this is Skvetna. Um, so I was flying all the way up here. Now I had to go this far north, go to this area because we have to be far enough away from size one and bigger airports to avoid the hunting camp efficiency penalty. And base camps also have to be three nautical miles or more from any other airport or base camp for you to deploy it. Now, if you are within 30 nautical miles of like a size one or bigger, like PASW, and there's another one, or one AK-6, you're going to get like, uh, you're going to get a hit for like a point, because, you know, they're not right next door, but they're within 25 miles, so yeah, I took like a two percentage point hit, but it still rounds up, so I'm still producing at 100%, basically, but I need to make sure that I was at least 50 nautical miles away from size two. Because that hurts. Basically, the larger the airport and the closer it is, the bigger a penalty your base camps take. I guess the airport disturbs the wildlife or something. Something along those lines. So I made sure that I wasn't within 50 nautical miles of uh, a size 2 or bigger, which is why we had to be this far away from Anchorage. And to stay away from this and not get all you know if i had tried to put it like down here all of these would have counted there's a size two in there there's a size two down here so just to make sure um that i wasn't going to get penalized heavily and my hunting camps weren't going to produce what i needed them to um we needed to build all all the way up here so one by one i flew the base camp construction kits up to the uh, mount Kliskin area and spread them three to five nautical miles apart along the side of the Yentna Riverbed. That dry riverbed offers flat, straight runways for easy access to all five of my base camps. Now, when you're placing a base camp, um, you have to be sure that you, whether you want it to be fishing or wildlife. If you want it to be fishing, leave it in the riverbed. Even though it's dry, it'll still count it as a fishing camp. But if you want to place hunting camps, it can't be in water. So I move the camp over here, just using the managed base camp display, put it into the forest, and it's a hunting camp, and you can, or it, it's available to be a wilderness instead of a fishing camp, and you can have hunting camps at it. That is an important thing if you, I got caught with that once, and I learned my lesson. So after we've deployed the base camps, then it's time to build the hunting camps, and the way what that looks like is you, um, you create a new factory, and then you tell it, like, I want to put the factory at Oh no, it would have a name first. Sorry about that. It would be Anchorage 
hunting number one or something like that, right? And I've already built these, but I'm just showing you where you do it. So you create the new factory, and we will put it at the deployed hunting camp, right? That's where this name shows up, is because when I deployed the hunting camp, I gave it uh, an airport moniker and name, and then I would tell it I want wilderness for hunting. You can choose the other two if you want to play with the other stuff, but I need to be able to put hunting camps. You need wilderness. And then you hit Create Factory. Once you do that, you end up with um, something like this. It, it's empty when you first do it, right? So to set it up, you need a container for the input, which is hunting gear. And then this, this container is already there. It's automatic, and that's for rations. Um, and each hunting camp needs three hunters. Well, first you have to build it, right? So this is a, here's one that's under construction. That's my last one in construction. And you have to bring 10 lumber, two builders, and two steel to this base camp and then hit build. And then it takes 24 hours or so to build a hunting camp. Uh, smokers are, I think, 36 hours. And the tanneries are like three days they take to build. And they all need different amounts of wood, steel, and builders. Uh, but anyway, while they're building, they look like this. They don't process anything. And then once they're built, they turn into this, and they need three hunters. And the hunters get tired. Right? So this guy's got 15% fatigue. But at 15%, it doesn't really have much of an effect. We're still processing at nominal production time. So that one had been recently refreshed. Let's find one where they're, they've got some tired going on. Here you go. Once it gets below about 70%, that's when I'm starting to see it's starting to how it's taking longer. If we go in here, you can see these guys are fatigued to 28%, and instead of 24 hours, it's taking almost 30 to do this production because they're getting tired. Again, once they get down to about 30% fatigue, that's when I'm going to start uh, replacing them. I mean, you could do it immediately, like as soon as it starts affecting production. But you're going to be ferrying so many hunters in and out of here. Uh, the gas isn't worth it. So it's, it's, it's better to let them kind of get down to 68. Between 65 and 68% somewhere is when I start uh, yanking, yanking them. Um, but yeah, you can see how it affects. Instead of just processing, doing this in a day, it takes a day plus some hours. And you have to decide for yourself. And then, of course, you have to set up containers on the other side to determine where they go. And for meat, I take it when they get to, when this fills up, it shoots this down to um some go to Svetna cuz it has one meat processing factory and then all of the rest of it goes down to Elmendorf where I'm going to build the rest of them at least for now. That's my plan. We'll see how that goes. So yeah, you build out, you just you need your you need one hunting gear container for three hunting camps, right? And then you need each hunting each row of hunting camps needs a container for pelts and for meat. You can see that this first row all goes to this pair. The second row all goes to this pair, and the third row goes to this pair. And this is the best I've seen or figured out as far as cramming as many hunting camps into a factory. Now, as far as... Um, so that's our hunting camps. Next, we need factories to process the raw meat and the fur. And that's what the fine fur and leather factories do. Well, part of it. So here's a full one. So same thing. You need a container for the input. And that's the pelts, right? And one container feeds three tanneries. And the tannery produces fur and leather. So you need a pair of containers on the output side for each row. Right? So the first row is going to this pair. Second row is going to this pair. The third row is going to this pair. And right now I'm just storing them. So you have you have three options as far as store output containers, as you can store it, and it just means you have to you have to figure out um, where you want it to go, um, and you have to take it there. Or you can use truck or boat transport. And when it gets to a certain level, if you choose this, you then tell it where you want it to go and at what threshold do you want the truck to take it. There is an economy of scale here. But anyway, so you can see for 50 of them. It costs eight thousand eight hundred fifty-seven dollars, right? If I go to the full limit, well, you know what the limit is? There a limit for the truck? Hmm. 
a hundred. Okay, yeah. Like if I just put in a bunch, of, yeah, hundred. So that's the most a truck can take is a hundred. Well, it's seventeen thousand. So that tells you that each one is what uh, seventeen dollars. But if you did one, it's six hundred and sixty-seven dollars, right? And then ten. See, it, it should be six thousand dollars if it was you know six hundred twenty-seven a piece or whatever, right? And then a hundred would be ten times. That would be twenty thousand dollars. And instead, it's seventeen. So the more you can put on the truck, the better. And these don't decay. With meat, you have a problem of decay. So the longer you wait to fill up those meat containers, the more meat you lose. I think it's something like three or four percent per day, something like that. But we're not gonna we're gonna change this back to storage. I don't really want them to take that to Fairbanks. Basically, that's the f this is the fur processing, or pelt processing. Pelts turn into fur and leather, and they go here. And then when these get close to full, I'm going to start looking for, you go to the trading hall. And we find some place that's going to pay us for our fur and leather. And in the, ooh, hello. In the area, there's lots of demand, it looks like. Well, well, there's one that's closer anyway, so we would do this one. 59.50 at Aki Akiak. Uh, and we, you can just put it on a truck and send it here. And when they get there, um, you can either do the contract before, or I found it best just to wait until they all get there, and then check out the number, and then you just click on this, and there it is. Uh, PFAC, yep. And that's what they're going to pay. And this price is available for six days, and they'll take up to 5184 so yeah, we would just type in, let's say if we sent 100, we do that, we'd say sign contract, and if the stuff is already there, it just, it just fulfills the contract the next time the system does a tick and checks all these things. Um, so that's the first stuff. Now for the smoker factory, there's not a whole lot of difference except for one thing. So you, hear, you notice here, it takes two days, at a, you know, if, if it's full or, or fully efficient, it takes two days to process four pelts. So it does two pelts per day. And in two days, you will get two fur and four leather. And it does not move anything out of these two containers until the end of the second day, and then it shoves them over here. So although it produces a fur every day and two leather per day, see, it's already got one, um, these will sit here until they hit two and four, and then they'll go to their containers. Now for... The meat processing. Uh, what am I? A uh, smoker. A uh, smokehouse. Blah, blah, blah. There. Here's one that I think I just finished building everything out. Yep. Brand new. It takes eight hours to process two. So this process, each smoker processes six meat per day. So six times nine, 54. And it puts them in here. And then I have a truck that's going to take it. I, I don't know where these should be storage. I don't even know what I have it set to. We're going to take it... Oh, because this is the one that's Svetna, so I'm just taking it all down to Elmendorf, and then from there I'll do a mass shipment. Okay, I guess that's my thinking. So we'll just let that continue. But it's the same thing. Your input is raw meat. And then um, you need one input container per three smokers, and you get nine smokers, and then each row needs a container. And then you can decide what you want to do with each container. So that's, that's processing the raw meat into smoked meat. And then you use the trading hall the same way um, to get the, um, sell the smoked meat to someone. And there's a good demand for it up here. And that is all the factories. You see, a size one airport can only hold one factory. Well, the manual didn't really mention that. So I hit that limitation once I tried to build a second factory here, and it said, nope, you can only have one at a size one. I was like, okay, well, then I'll just build the rest of them down here at Elmendorf. But, of course, I need nine, and I was counting on being able to use both of these um, to maybe get there, so now I'm going to have to figure something else out with that. The other problem is, during all this, somebody else went and built a factory at Anchorage. So the limit is five per 
you know, one factory per airport size for everybody, not just for you. So I don't get necessarily, unless nobody was here, I don't get five factories. And I need five for fur processing because I have five base camps. That was always our hunting camp, hunting factories, whatever you want to call it. So now I'll probably have to, I'll have to find another place to stick my fifth factory for fur. And I'm going to have to find another place for additional meat processing. Probably along the way, there's a bunch of, um, let's see here, small, uh, you know, size ones and stuff down here. Like I could put some here, one there, one there, one there, or put four of them all in here and just kind of just have the trucks bring it down and then figure out what I want to do with the smoked meat once it's done. There are choices and I'll deal with that, uh, later so i built my fur processing at anchorage and meat processing at squetna and elmendorf now i use trucks for meat transport and atrs for pelts right now that could change over time but moving meat 100 um units of raw meat at a time is more cost efficient with the trucks than it is to have an atr picking them up uh, just from a math perspective now for pelts um, once I have a surplus in pelts um, and I can increase my shipping size to 100, I may do the same thing and move pelts to trucks. Um, and then the ATRs will just worry about ferrying hunters um, back and forth and hunting gear and food. So they'll just be a supply run and they won't have to pick up anything from there other than the tired hunters that need to go home. Um, at least that's my plan, so we'll see how that works out. At first, I was running... Uh, 208s from Anchorage all the way up to where my hunting camps are. And what I found is that at the time, I didn't have FBOs at any of my hunting camps. It didn't even occur to me until much later. So I was having to run this 208 with enough fuel to get back. Well, that's a long way, so basically they weren't, be they weren't efficient as far as how much cargo they could hold, so... My second idea, which I, I still am fond of, is creating a forward supply base at Squetna, since I was going to have a factory there anyway, and I was going to have to land planes to pick, you know, drop things off, pick things up, whatever. Um, I decided to go ahead and put an FBO here, and then move the 208s up to Squetna, and use an ATR to take huge amounts of hunting uh, gear, hunters, food, um, with a trip, and then just bring the tired hunters back. Then the 208s operate out of here as a home base, and um, they worry about resupplying all five of these. And if there's, you know, supplies or something in the area, then they can go on a short hop or what have you. But yeah, their job is to make sure that these things stay fully supplied so that they're as efficient as possible so that we get our uh, 450 meat <laughs> and uh, 54, whatever it was, um, pelts every day. Uh, how many? What, 90 pelts. 90 pelts a day. So we want to make sure that we get everything. And my last change for this operation so far was to place an FBO at each one of these uh, base camps so that the 208s only needed to carry enough fuel to get there. Um, that allows me to put more cargo and stuff into the 208s um, and make the transit a little more efficient so they don't have to make as many trips. I'm also testing, and I have not finished this test, is putting in crew rooms at each one of the hunting camps, the base camps, the FBOs there. Nine, which is how many hunters I usually leave at each place, to see if I can stop paying hotel charges for the hunters that are waiting to be used. Like when you, when you have to refit them, you know, you have to change them out. So I'm going to see if that works, but it takes nine days to build all that, so i got to wait until this is built. And I'm sure you guys know how to build FBOs, but if not, it's fairly simple. You just do it from the uh, World Airport screen, and then you just tell it, oh, you can, you can choose your hunting camp. So you just choose an Anchorage Hunting, and I hit Display. Now, I already have an FBO here or being built. See? Um, but... If I hadn't, I, there would be a button here that says build FBO. You just build an FBO and then you add whatever you want to it. Um, and this is what I'm building there. Um, I'm not going to build any repair facilities. We are putting in uh, 500 gallons of jet fuel 
Um, no tie downs because no one's going to stay there. And then nine crew rooms are being built, and that won't be ready until the 16th. So that's when I'll be able to notify you if this does save on hotel fees or does not. Uh, and that's it. The, each one of these is real simple. Um, I'm hoping that it saves me money in the end because there is a weekly ownership cost for these FBOs. Yes, $288. I think right now I'm spending like uh, um, 1400 or something dollars a week in hotel fees. So this will pay for itself if this works. If not, then the fuel's still worth it. I think. But you can always dismantle it if I don't like it. And then, uh, of course, once I figure out what I do and do not like about how I'm doing this operation, which is basically a fixed base operation at two um, size fives, size one forward supply base, and then five base camps, um, as I'm, I'm planning to copy it here to Fairbanks. I'm already started. Um, all that's left is to start dropping base camps, and I'm going to do that tonight. So after all that, we come to the last portion of the video, which is the full flight. So you've seen the Cessnas dropping off base camps and how to deploy. Um, for the last part, it's a full flight video, and it's flying an ATR to Skvitna, carrying some hunters and supplies. Yeah, enjoy. And today we're going to fly from Anchorage out to our forward supply base. We're taking some hunting gear, a uh, bunch of hunters, and I uh, think, oh, some steel and lumber. And when we get into the air, I'll explain, you know, how, what the forward supply base is and how I'm using that with my camps. But for now, let's fly. Start the before start checklist. Starting the before start checklist. Parking brake. On. Landing gear lever. Down. Power management knob. Take off. Gust lock. On. Engine controls. That. Exterior doors. Closed. Ground power. Set. Check. Pre-flight checks complete. I'll get our clearance. Yeah, we don't really need that today. It's VFR. We're going to try anyway. But we do need to... For these to clear, there we go. Three greens, fuel pumps, cross feed, all good. Need the beacon. Good, 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 good. Hydraulics on. Set. Off. Devices and signs. Correct. Oxygen. Good there. Lock the door. Radar to standby. We may need that today. It's the airport's operating under VFR, but there's uh, light rain in the area. Flies position. GPS. Flight plan. This is going to be a simple one. But I am going to put the entire thing in on the FMS. Watch this. Anchorage to Smetna, or however you pronounce it, which is P A S W. And that's really the whole flight plan, which you need to clear that discontinuity. There we go, flight plan's in. Let's do performance initialization. Uh, we're going to try 8500. There's supposedly a ceiling at 9500. Oh, no, no. We can't go that high. There we go. And then for weight. And fuel. That's the 100 pounds that just disappears. Don't know why. Uh, 0 0.9. And then one extra tenth just for barley. Makes it a little easier to get off the ground. A little smoother. Me thinks. Yay. And performance is set. Looks like 106 knots. The only thing we didn't set was barometric pressure. There it is. And that's uh, 2986.
All right. So we are done with that. Here we go. Uh, that's... Oh, the thing that I almost always forget, and that's on the wrong setting. That on. That's where we want it. 1,300 pounds. Uh, trans... Wait, this doesn't really matter, but fine. Alright, now for, we said 8,500. There we go. And speed will be auto. And we will be doing heading and ILS, IAS, not, I, not ILS, that's for landing. Um, for, oh, they have runway heading. And the runway heading for 3 3 is 3 2 9. 3 2 9. There we go. That's set. Uh, all right, continue. Continue. Landing gear indicators. 3 green. Fuel pumps. On. Begin. On. Prop brake. Ready. DC and AC generators. Set. Hydraulics. On. Ice protection. Off. Passenger signs and emergency lights. Set. O2. Check. Anti-skid and stick pusher fault lights. Out. FMS initialized. Check. Radar. Standby. CDLS. Locked. Departure heading and altitude. Set. Autopilot modes. Set. Speed target. Auto. Before start checks complete. Ready to start engines? Uh, begin. Tracking. Oh, we, we shall check that. We are tracking. Check. Wheel chocks. Off. Peck and EEC fault lights. Off. Exterior door indicators. Out. Begin engine start. Okay, first start of the day. We use A and B. Ten percent. We Your bring the fuel in until you land and shut Captain down the engines. To the north with whiskey. Zero, Oil pressure's coming up. Starter is off. Echo, one golf kilo Romeo. Cross runway seven left. Contact tower on one one eight decimal. ITT three. is good. Move this engine to auto. Taxi two and hold short runway tree tree. The Maybe? taxiway Echo one golf kilo Romeo. Mm. Cross runway seven left. Barley zero one. Something's not working right. This broke did. Oh, there it goes. Whoa. Okay. That was weird. Anchorage ground, Raven Flight 55, two requesting pushback. Alright. Raven Flight 55, two pushback request accepted. Okay, 70. We'll be able to turn this off and the DC generator should kick on. Right? So now we can start the second engine. Well, let's kick off the ground power unit so they can get that out of the way before I start spinning a prop. Okay, things are acting funky. I may need to restart the plane. Why can't I? Oh. Let's try this again. Yep. It goes the flight recording software. There's 10%. Fuel in. Oil pressure's good. Starter is off. 
ITT's good. Move this to auto. Yeah, now things are working correctly. Okay. Apparently it's just a flight recording software was interfering. Right. All good. Just turn on our position and taxi lights. All white here. Check payload again. I know I looked at it already. We're good. Numbers are 104. That's awfully high. That's what I would have expected. Okay, 104 and 110. All right. Continue. Continue. Engine start control. Off. DC and AC generators. Check. GPU disconnected. Check. Condition levers. Auto. TRU. On. Startup checks complete. Ready start pushback checklist. Begin. Nose wheel steering. Check. Ready to push back. Check. Com door closed. Check. Prop brake. Off. Pito heat. Off. Position and taxi lights. On. Anti-skid test. Check. Transponder set and on. Check. Pushback checks complete. Should I start the before taxi list? Yes. Nose wheel steering. On. MFD to navigation mode. Flight recorder. Check. Checklist complete. All right, time to get moving. Hmm. Well, that wasn't awake. Start the before takeoff checklist. Start the before takeoff checklist. Starting before takeoff checklist. Brakes. Check. Rudder indicator. Center. Gust lock. Hey, okay, I need a my taxi information here. Three three. E one G K R. Cross seven left. E one G K R. Where's E one? The G one. There's K and Romeo. There's there's no here's E. Is this is that supposed to be E1? And, and then golf. Okay, so he wants some. Well, that's behind me. And why didn't they give me Lima? Golf one to Kilo. Uh, I'll we'll see if we can get to it. Okay. E1 GKR. Yeah, okay, so I think E1's back there. There's E1, I see it now. This is E1. We will attempt to follow their directions. All right. Repeat. Dust lock. Off. Flight controls. Free and correct. Flaps. 15. Takeoff configuration test. Check. Checklist complete. Oh, that's actually G1. We were given E1. We're going to try to follow the directions, so E1 must be over there. Right here. Starting before takeoff checklist. Brakes. 
Anchorage Tower Barley 01 ready at runway tree tree departure to the north. Barley 01 altimeter 29 or decimal 851021 at 4. Departure to the north approved. Cleared for takeoff runway tree tree. Alaska 7006 turn next. Start the takeoff checklist. Starting takeoff checklist. Cleared for takeoff, takeoff runway clearance. tree tree Barley Check. 01. Correct runway. Check. Runway is clear. Check. Checklist complete. Takeoff power set. Alaska 7006 contact ground on 121 decimal Airspeed alive. Gear up. Check. On. Off. Anchorage Tower, Barley 01, continue for north departure. Barley 01, leaving my airspace frequency change approved. Anchorage Tower, Barley 01, frequency change. Anchorage Approach, Barley 01, is type 2 miles northwest of Anchorage, 1,200 feet. Request clearance to transition Charlie airspace. Barley 01, Anchorage Approach. Squawk 5725. Squawk 5725, Barley 01. Barley 01, radar contact, 3 miles northwest of Anchorage, 1,800 feet. Clear to the Charlie airspace. Maintain on navigation. Cleared through the Charlie airspace, Barley 01. Flaps up. Go to climb. Let the autopilot have it. Horizon two zero zero two climb and maintain three thousand feet. Although we are not gonna get the eighty five hundred, I don't think. Let's go. Forty five hundred for now. Turn off the taxi and landing lights. And I mentioned that um I was gonna show you what all this is about. But what's going on? Zero, zero, two, and uh, why don't I get into cruise configuration? Then I'll then we'll bring that up. Descend and maintain one thousand six hundred feet. Horizon two zero zero two. So basically, all our hunting camps are out here, where that little waypoint is. And at first, I was having my two eights go from Pank Anchorage out to here. And of course, since there's no fuel at at base camps. Um, they would have to carry fuel for both ways, so they couldn't really carry very much. So instead, I put an FBO at Skwetna, 
And now I take huge loads of stuff up here, and the, there's a uh, couple of 208s out here that feed five camps. And what that what that looks like... Go ahead and go to cruise. That looks like is... Me starting my takeover of Alaska. So there's one. These got Sky Val or Sky Ol has two base camps. Nelsie has two. Bordox has one. Then there's some stuff way over here. But that's. Um. Anyway, and we've got. Five. Making sure everything's okay over here. Yeah, so I've got five hunting camps, and here's Lucas in one of the 208s. The other 208's back here. She's already done some runs. Um, you know, he's we're, we're finishing the build on number five, and then I'm going to decide whether I'm going to put a sixth one out here or if I'm going to have to start another one of these. You know, I put a, su a, a supply base, like, over here and then go out this way. I don't know yet. I haven't scouted that. But right now, that's my strategy is... Use a forward supply base, and this has a bunch of lumber and steel and hunters and hunting gear and food. And then these guys take out what the hunting camps need, um, and then bring back the tired hunters. And then we fly in, and we drop off whatever they need in big loads in an ATR. And then we take back um, the tired hunters and pelts. So that's what we're doing. A little bit of a rainbow. Turn on the weather radar, see if this stuff is just light rain or if it's something to worry about. Right now it's not even showing up on the radar. All right, so we're going to be landing at uh, Skvetna. And we're landing on runway 10, which is 116. I'm going to set my heading bug for 116. Okay. And we'll see if I remember how to land this thing. Take, takeoff went relatively smooth. Sure, why it couldn't manage speed in the notch? Anchorage Center, Barley, zero one four thousand six hundred feet. 
Zero we can take care of it. It's a quick flight. We'll start our descent here shortly. We're going to drop down to, I don't know, somewhere between 12 and 1400 feet. Hundred will do. Vertical speed. Got a takeoff. Preparing for arrival. Start the de start the descent checklist. Starting the descent checklist. Power management knob. Take off. No devices and fasten seal belt signs. On. Review landing elevation. 122 feet. Check. Brief the approach. Uh, we're going to fly over midfield. Uh, turn on a uh, left downwind. Make a left pattern for runway 10, which has a heading of 116. As we approach the airfield, we will go take off the autopilot. We will turn it off. Landing and taxi lights are on. Airport should be in here somewhere. I think. Uh, seven miles out, so yeah, we should be able to see it. We're going to fly over it one way or another. That's a short rainbow. Oh, I'll get the airport? Really? That wasn't in the forecast. 
This could be a turnaround trip. Uh, I can still see. Oh, it's rain. I could turn this on, but they really don't do anything. Except be annoying. Okay, we should definitely be able to see the airport. Is that it? I have not landed here yet. My AI has been doing all that work. I think that's the runway right there. No, that's not going the right direction, though. That has to be it. I don't see anything else. Yeah, that's it. Oh, there's... Yep, there's the green and white. Okay. Autopilot off. And let's begin slowing down. the field. I don't know if we can get a glimpse of the windsock. If there is one. No. Don't see one. Okay. Setting flaps 15. Well, that was a gust of wind. Jeez. Speed 160. Landing gear. Mm, not yet. Alright. Why did it... Why did my heading get reset? That's not helpful. One sixteen. Jeez. Not helpful at all. Why did that happen? Oh, okay. So I don't have to listen to you over and over. Responding to voice commands. Start listening. Resuming responding to voice commands. Okay, this should be far enough. Turn around now. And we'll go ahead and drop the gear. Setting flaps 30. Greens and flaps full. Alright, lights are good. Three greens, flaps, all good. As she said. Start bringing her back to 120. Good lineup. Feel a little bit high. Okay, a lot high. Papa Alpha Sierra Whiskey Traffic Barley, 014 miles northwest, 2,500 feet, inbound to land runway 10. Start the landing checklist. Start the landing checklist. He's not listening. Oh, start the before landing checklist. Hello? Start the before landing checklist. 
starting the before Jeez. landing checklist. Queen landing gear zero at two knots. Check. Flaps. Check. Power management knob. Take off. TLU low speed eliminated. Check. Cabin pressure. Check. Checklist complete. Two hundred. Pull up. One hundred. Fifty. Forty. Thirty. Twenty. Ten. Landing time logged. Sixty knots. All right. Nice little short field landing with plenty of space to give. And I didn't slam it down on the runway too hard, I don't think. Flaps up. Start the chrono for the engine. And we can turn our landing and strobes off. Feathering two. Two is off. Parking brake. is it zero we can ask for a GPU because the GPU comes off the plane on this side that prop is down prop is off now we can feather one turn off unnecessary lights everything left on is beacon we'll get on GPU first and then we'll cut one engine off time logged the flight is finished. It has been monitored by on air. I'm waiting for this prop to get to zero. And let them fetch their bags. Got the fuel pumps. And there's zero. There we go. Passengers are free to go. Okay. Hydraulics are off. Fuel pumps are off. All lights except beacon. Actually, we can turn the beacon off now. Engines are not running. And everything here is in the proper place. I think we're all good to go. Oh, battery off. Oh, I'm curious to see what did on air have to say about my landing. Regular. Yeah, that's about it. Short field, regular I'll take, because typically short field landings can be a little stiff. And since we're not loaded to the gills for this runway. I probably don't need to do everything I'm going to do this time, but not having taken off from this runway yet, I'm going to anyway. And I will explain all of it here shortly, but this is basically everything you can do in an ATR as far as I know. If you're going to if you're doing short field takeoffs. First, we're going to go to the very end of the runway. the nose wheel straight. Okay. Checklist oh. complete. Boost is on. Lead air is off, which also turns off the air conditioning. And 
we're going to be going into the ramp section of the throttle. That's everything that I know of you can do to make sure that your short field takeoff happens the way you want. So, we are taking off. Don't really need to look down for this. Takeoff power set. I'm going to wait till power comes fully up. That's it. Airspeed alive. Seventy knots cross check. Check. B one, rotate. Starting climb checklist. Pause Airborne time lock. Gear up. Trim for V two plus five. Check. Yaw damper. On. Pito heat. Anchorage center barley zero one. Off. Southeast of Papa Alpha Sierra Whiskey, 700 feet. Request flight following. On. Checklist complete. On Anchorage Center. Squawk 7162. Squawk 7162, Barley 01. Barley 01, radar contact. Acceleration Eight height. Southeast Max Papa continuous. Alpha Sierra Whiskey, 1600 feet. Altimeter 29 decimal 87. Roger, Barley, zero one. Setting flaps zero. Setting power to climb. Let the autopilot have it from there. But yeah, even not fully loaded, we probably... The nose gear probably came off about 100 feet before the runway, and I think there's maybe just 60 or so feet for the main gear. So yeah, I think somewhere between 70 and 90 is probably going to be right for how, you know, how heavy we could be. And now that's with almost no headwind. So that's how I'm going to have to... If there's no headwind, I'm really going to have to consider 60 the limit. And then, like, 5 knots, maybe... ...70, and then, um... If you have at least a 10-knot headwind, I think we could probably get by with 80. But yeah. We want a margin of error. Now, the other thing with a short field takeoff is... You saw where V1 happens. There's no if something goes wrong, we're we're taking off. I mean, there's just nothing else. I mean, cuz there's no way we're stopping before we end up in the water. I mean, unless we lose both engines, then I'd rather roll off the end of the runway into the water than get airborne and then, you know, be fighting an aircraft and But losing one engine, no, that would be a definite takeoff anyway. We would have to lose it early on. I mean, like, if we went to power up and one of them was acting funny, then we'd just, you know, give up. But uh, if, if we hit V1, or if we're, you know, approaching V1 and an engine suddenly goes kaput, no. Nope. We're, we're taking off anyway. There's just there's not enough room to stop. If something like totally critical goes wrong, like there's no way it's going to lift off, then, well, slam on the brakes and hit the water as softly as we can. <laughs> not a whole lot else we can do. I don't think I'm going to bother with the weather radar. I don't think we're going to need it, but I can turn off the landing and taxi lights. That can put us into cruise. Start the cruise checklist. Starting the cruise checklist. Power management knob. Cruise. Cabin pressure and temp. Check. Arrival briefing. Hmm. We're expecting runway 33. So we'll be... I'm expecting they're going to give us left traffic for runway 33. 
Uh, we'll drop down to eh, 1,200, 1,300 feet. Enter the pattern, then start our descent to get down the pattern altitude. Um, go out here and do a turnaround. Our V approach speed. One oh one. Wow, that's that's low. Fuel is balanced. And it's not like I can take less fuel because then you end up, I end up getting hit by on air for the uh, safety thing for not having 30 minutes worth of fuel. I mean, I had 29 minutes left when we landed at PASW and got hit for that. So... It are what it are. There, not so dark. All right, runway three three is a heading of three two nine. And I'm not doing it because I'm going to have the autopilot doing much with it. I like budding the, bugging the runway heading because it makes it real easy for the pattern. You know, I'm just going to put myself a quarter mile off the runway and then fly the reciprocal, which means basically just put the bug right there. And I know I'm 180 degrees to the runway heading. Fly out until I'm at a comfortable distance to start my, um, you know, my turn. And then make the runway. And then, you know, if if I'm if I go too far on my pattern, which I don't don't think it'll happen, having the bug there also lets me know if I line up the little runway, you know, the airport dot with the bug that I'm heading towards the airport on the runway heading. So that's that's how I use it. To each their own, I suppose. I don't have any questions for the Magic 8-Ball. Approach Barley 01. 
Request clearance to transition Charlie airspace. Molly zero one anchorage approach. Clear through the Charlie airspace. Clear through Charlie airspace, Barley zero one. I think we'll have a thousand feet over us for the, from the clouds, maybe. Not, we're dropping down to 3,500. I mean, we're getting close to descent. I guess we could pre descend. Last thing we want is somebody coming out of the clouds and smacking into us. Yeah, I'm gonna drop down. Might have to make it. Although we're definitely a thousand feet below the clouds. Visibility is below my personal minimums. I'm going to go ahead and... contact the airport. Anchorage Tower Barley 01 is one tree miles northwest, 2,800 feet with whiskey to land. Barley 01 Anchorage Tower. Altimeter 29 or decimal 85, wind 015 at 5. Enter left downwind runway tree tree. That's what we were expecting. Fly left traffic runway tree tree barley 01. And taxi lights are still coming up through the freaking wheel wells. Okay, since I know we're clear of obstacles, I'm going to go ahead. Oh, we already are. Yeah, we're going down to 1,500. Now let's get down to pattern altitude.
and good visibility for a VFR approach. We won't have to push for uh, IFR. Start slowing down a little bit. Make sure it didn't move my heading bug again. And autopilot off. Start our turn to the reciprocal. Which is there. All right, oh, let's get our first notch of flaps coming. She'll take care of that in a second. Maybe. Good already. He's asleep. Oh, you know why? Setting flaps 15. There we go. I didn't do the descent checklist. Speed yeah. 160. Landing gear. It moved my heading bug again. Egg nabbit. Oh. Yeah, we're. Oh, it should have been 116 for 329, and it didn't. I did. Okay. Arlie, 0 1 wind 0 tree, 5 at 7. Clear to land runway tree tree. Yeah. That was, that was all me. Clear to land runway tree tree, Barley 0 1. Okay. I think we'll go ahead and put the gear down now. Need to get a little lower too. Three greens and flaps fifteen. Start our turn back to the runway. Turn these off. Oh, that's not off. Setting flaps 30. Oh.
right, good rollout, and we're on glides. Well, a little high. One bubble. One light, if you will. And we'll get that corrected. There we go. Wing zero one zero at four knots. In the pipe, five by five. Five hundred. Time log. Sixty knots. Barley zero one exit runway when able. All right, flaps up. I think that sequencing was a little close. The jet taking off ahead of us. But they can actually have two planes on the runway of certain sizes at certain distances, so that's definitely not the busy the airport isn't that busy, but whatever. Yay, landing lights. Strobes are off. Yes, sir. Contact ground on one two one decimal niner. Earth the engine timer. There we go. Clear the active. There we go. I'm gonna go to parking. Anchorage ground Barley Zero One Taxi to parking. Barley Zero One Taxi to General Aviation Parking using taxiway uniform. Taxi mm. to General Aviation Parking using taxiway uniform. Okay, Barley we just go straight. We aren't really GA, but whatever. That was an easy, that's an easy taxi. Straight ahead. Then we'll see if anybody's going to be there to park us. Clear. Clear. All right. Okay, you're being weird. There. I see anybody over there, I think. Yeah. Start the after landing checklist. Isn't that what it's called? I don't know. Repeat. Arrival briefing. Oh, check. Checklist complete. Yeah. I don't remember what that next checklist is called. That's all right. I remember what's on it, which was this timer, turning off that, making sure pedo's off, no ice stuff. I thought it was. Well, the after landing checklist, but apparently not. Normally she starts that by herself, but I had forgotten to check off that last item on the previous list, so she did not continue. 
this looks like us. Feathering two. Okay, how far to the right do you want me to go, dude? Yeah, you're not making any sense. And you're in the wrong place. Okay, shutting down two. Those wheels now on the line. A little bit further. Parking brake, feathering one, two. Is it zero? Let's get a GPU going. Let them touch their stuff. All right. Uh, available. Go. Turn the extra lights off. And shut down one. Engine off time log. The flight is finished. It has been monitored by on air. Fuel pumps and hydraulics. And there's zero. It's all done. Now we can turn off the beacon. Engines are out. Everything's done up there. That's turned off. That's to unlock the door. We can get out. Radar is off. Everything's set. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this quick little double hop flight. It was um, definitely interesting. The weather was semi-cooperative. At least we got to stay VFR. Uh, but uh, if you enjoyed this kind of flight and this kind of story where I do lots of things together instead of just doing like just the Cessna hops, and then just the ATR stuff, but showing how it all comes together. If you like this more story-driven kind of thing, uh, let me know in the comments or by hitting the like button and subscribing. So I know to make more. For now, Barley out. Hmm.